First off, I want to thank the uh, brave men and women who work behind the wall. I want to thank them on a national level because their job goes on How do they try to turn a guard? Well, President, uh, correctional officer, sorry, I apologize, uh, but correctional officer. Uh... How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji, host of Tear Talk. Guys, I got a real good video coming your way. It's going to be another collaboration. I got Gary York back on the scene. I got Connie Eileen, Keith Helwig, Russ Hamilton, and we're going to talk about inmate manipulation. So we're going to share signs that you should be aware of and just basically how to protect yourself from inmates who try to play that game. I'm going to start off the video, then I'm going to kick it off to Gary York. Gary then will kick it off to Connie. Connie will kick it off to Keith. Keith will kick it off to Russ. And we have ourselves a completed video. I love doing these collaborations because it provides so many different perspectives. And I really enjoy, you know, hearing these different perspectives because I get to learn as well. But I hope you guys are enjoying these collaborations. If you are, please hit the like and maybe comment. Tell me that you're enjoying them so I can keep them coming. And I'm going to go to our sponsor. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about inmate manipulation. Each one's going to present a perspective. So, guys, if you have it, the show Tear Talks for you, you brave men and women that work in corrections. So, please, subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. The bell's going to notify you every time I post a video. Stand by for our sponsor. And when we come back, we'll be discussing inmate manipulation, starting with me. Stand by. I wanted to attend a university that had an intelligence program. I wanted to look at problems different. I wanted to increase my critical thinking abilities. AMU offered those avenues to expand. Obtaining your degree as an adult, you're actually paying yourself and investing in yourself. You can't put a dollar on it, it's priceless. It's something that can never be taken away from you. American Military University, learn from the leader. All right, guys, thank you for listening to the sponsor. Guys, I love this topic. It's inmate manipulation. I have a whole playlist full of inmate manipulation videos, but I have to be specific. I have to, can't talk about a lot of different things. I have an assignment and I got to stay in the assignment because I don't want to run into what other people are talking about. But I am first on deck. I'm the first all-star, if you will, that's presenting in this game. And then next is going to be Gary York, Connie Eileen, Keith Helwig, Russ Hamilton. What an all-star cast, if I may say so myself. The cast of Tear Talk. Regulars. And uh, always great information. So real quick, before I get on to what I'm going to cover, I just want to mention a couple of things about manipulation. I want to make sure that's something that we don't overlook. One thing is never let inmates isolate you from support staff that divide and conquer. Never let that happen. Listen to your gut, because sometimes manipulation is so slow and subtle that we may not pick up on it, but something in our body is telling us something doesn't feel right. So listen to your gut. Also, if you see someone getting caught up, speak up. Tell them. Say, hey, listen, something doesn't look right. You know, because a lot of people get concerned. Well, Ganji, if I walk up to him, what about if I'm wrong? Well, the greater consequences, and if you're wrong, the greater consequences is if you're right and you don't say something. So the thing is, don't worry about being socially acceptable because at the end of the day, if you're watching out for me, I'm good with you telling me that. I'm not going to close you up and say, hey, listen, why are you tell me that? Like, what? That's wrong. No. Okay, I appreciate your perspective. You know, let me let me pull back a little bit. I didn't pick up on that. I appreciate that. And again, that's your experience talking. So listen to that, please. It's important that you listen to that. And the other thing I wanted to mention is never let an inmate take you out of your prescribed role. You know what your job is. Remain focused. Stay on that course. Now, the one thing I want to focus on today is... How some manipulative inmates, and again, this ain't a catch-all, because there's a lot we can cover here, but I'm just going to focus on this because I want to make sure I don't repeat what someone else has said. I never let an inmate make me feel responsible for the negative choices that they make, which means that I'm not going to feel guilty for choices that you did that you know you shouldn't do. So let's say I had to write up an inmate, and the inmate comes up to me and says, hey, Ganji, if you write me up, I'm not going to be able to see my children. Okay, well, that's on you. That's not on me. You did something foolish. You did something wrong. You're going to be held responsible for that. And then you're going to have to tell your kids how you messed up. Not me. You know, because you'll probably go back and tell your kids, well, if that officer didn't write me up, I'd be able to see you. Yeah, but why did the officer write you up? I think that's a question we don't ask in corrections. We're so quick to get rid of these tools that we need, but we never ask why those tools are being utilized, why they're being implemented. So guys, ask the why for the public anyway. Ask the why. Again, yeah, this officer wrote you up, but why did he write you up? That's the key. Also, 
when you find yourself defending an inmate, even though they did something wrong. Don't do that. Sometimes we have providers that may have an inmate so developed in the programming that they feel if you write the inmate up, the inmate's going to lose the programming and the progress that they made so far. Yeah, but the inmate still made a bad choice and we have to be fair, firm, and consistent. Hey, it's a shame. He may have to start over again, but technically he wasn't ready anyway. If he was doing so good in your programming, he wouldn't have made that bad choice or she wouldn't have made that bad choice. So maybe it's time we do a hard reset. You know, let him go through what he's got to go punitively and then we bring it back because let's not forget part of rehabilitation is punitive. Accountability, responsibility, we seem to lose those words. So again, make sure that you're not defending an inmate when you know they're wrong. Also, never think about an inmate when you're home. I don't care on what level. The moment you're thinking about an inmate and you're not at work, it's too personal. And again, that's on every level. You know, if I'm watching football and I, 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 my team wins, I can't wait to tell some an inmate at the facility why. Why am I at home with my family and now I watch a game and I can't wait to go see an inmate at work to tell them, hey, Giants won. It's too personal. Also, on another note for inmates that try to push some form of intimate relationship, if you're thinking about that inmate at home while you're with your family, you're too involved. Pull yourself back. Let somebody know. You know what's funny real quick, and I'll end on this. Sometimes we get caught up in the game and we're not perfect. And I believe Gary's going to go into a little more about leverage and how inmates will utilize leverage to get us to do things we shouldn't be doing. So basically, they talk about downing a duck and how leverage was created. And then eventually when the officer felt like saying no... Well, it's too late. I have this as an inmate now. I can turn this in. So you better say yes or you're done. And of course, the officer concedes because they're afraid about losing their job. There are some people that have been caught up that have unfortunately played the game with the inmate. And then when the inmate finally unveils all their cards and says, hey, if you don't do this for me, I'm going to turn you in because I got this, this and this. I have seen officers say, you know what? I made those bad choices. So you can turn me in because I'm going to do that today with myself. I'm not going to let my bad choices affect everyone else. And I'll give that person respect because we're human and we get caught up and it could happen to anyone. Don't think it cannot happen to you. But once you find out, are you going to CYA, cover your own ass? Or are you actually going to do the right thing? And that's the key here. You got caught up. Now, if you cover your own ass, everybody's going to get caught up in the consequence. Because one day you may bring in a contraband item that's going to go into my neck. Or my partner's neck. Or you're going to step up and say, you know what, I made a bad choice. But these are my choices. So I'm going to go ahead and turn myself in. And I would give respect for that. But again, these are just a lot of scenarios. I'm throwing a lot at you. But I love this topic. I can go all day. You should check out my playlist. But what do you got, Gary? Inmate manipulation is the name of the game when it comes to prison. Inmates want things that they don't have, and they're always wanting things they don't have, such as food from the outside, you know, good old McDonald's, good old Burger King, maybe a steak. They want alcohol because they don't have it in the prison. They want cigarettes, they want drugs, and many of them want weapons. And many inmates want sex with staff members. Can't say it any plainer, it's the truth, it's the name of the game. So what do you have to do as a staff member to prevent the inmates from manipulating you? Hi, I'm Gary York. I was asked by Anthony Gonzi of Tear Talk to do a short little video, so I'm going to make it short and sweet and to the point. I don't have time to tell a lot of stories. There's other people that wish to get their comments in as well on this round table. But what I just told you is, is basically it in a nutshell. So what you have to do is you have to come to work and be attentive because inmates are sizing you up every minute of the day. They're watching how you walk. They're watching how you talk. They're watching how you act. They're watching how you perform your job. And they are watching to see 
if you're following the rules. That's right. Inmates know the rules because they are there 24-7, 365 days a year. The inmates know what you're supposed to do, and they know what they're supposed to do also. So you have to know your job, and you have to perform your job uh, correctly and by the policies and procedures, and not allow the inmates to manipulate you. Inmates start with small little items, as we all know, and they always go for maybe a piece of candy. Can I get a piece of paper from your notebook? Hey, CO, can I borrow your pen? Listen, don't start lending anything to inmates because once you give them anything, even a piece of candy, then it goes to a cigarette. Then they've got you. Because here in Florida, under Florida Statute 944.47, food is contraband under that statute. And it's a felony. Doesn't mean they'll always prosecute you for it, but it is a felony. But inmates will work you and work their way up. They look for officers with low self-esteem, the ones that keep their head down, the ones that don't perform their job well, the ones that need a boost. And they start boosting you up by saying how nice you look today, how good your hair looks, or if you're a man, hey, you're really doing a good job. You really know what you're doing. We really like you in this dorm. Hey, you may get that sometimes even if you are a firm, fair, and consistent officer. We like you in this dorm. But listen, the main thing is don't start giving the inmates anything they're not supposed to have. Do your job. Be firm, fair, and consistent. And you won't get in trouble. And you won't be on the evening news for having sex with inmates. You won't be on the evening news for bringing drugs in. Now, with that said, if you see an officer being manipulated by an inmate, please report it. You're not being a snitch. Report an officer that you think might be falling down. Now, you can go to the officer first, talk to them, if, and tell them, look, you may be falling into the inmate trap of manipulation. So go to the officer first. Give that officer the benefit of the doubt. Talk it over with them. Say, hey, you're spending a little too much time in the cell and you're talking too much to the inmate or looks a little like you're getting a little too friendly with the inmate, talk to the officer first. If that doesn't work, then you have to go the next step. So always give your fellow officers benefit of the doubt and go to them first. Unless you see a felony being committed right in front of your eyes where an officer is handing an inmate contraband, that's a different story. You need to take care of that right then and now. But I just wanted to get a few words in there. Everybody has to speak. I think we only have five minutes or less, so let me stop now because I can keep rambling on forever. Be safe. Don't be manipulated. Thank you very much. Gary York. Hi, Connie Aline here from Civilian Corrections Academy. Uh, the question today or the topic today is how do you know when you're being manipulated by an inmate, right? So I can reflect back on when I first started in corrections and I came into work one day and I'm walking through the clinic to go to my office and an inmate says, um, hey, Miss Aline, and I'm thinking like, oh, I don't even know this inmate. How does he know my name? But hey, Miss Aline, um, your makeup looks really nice today. And I didn't really know what to say. It was kind of awkward. So I just kind of looked and I kept walking, which was already strike one, right? <laughs> um, uh, then, you know, the next day comes around, he's not in the clinic, but the following day he makes it back to the clinic and I'm thinking to myself, like, why is he in the clinic again? So he's in the clinic again, hence here comes like another compliment, at which point I'm like, what the hell, what's going on? So I didn't really know, like, what I should say, what I shouldn't say, I didn't want to be the cause of a use of force or some sort of inmate interaction with custody. I mean, I just didn't know what was going to happen because I was still so new. And so I had like the forethought to just kind of ask the clinic officer. And I remember asking the officer, I was like, listen, I don't know why this dude keeps coming to the clinic, but this is his second time in the clinic. And every time he comes in, he's got something to say to me. He was like, say like what? So I was like, you know, he's he's made now two compliments and um, I didn't say anything back because I didn't know what to say. And so he was like, 
kind of you have to check him. You can't let him talk to you that way. And it's not because, you know, um, I want you to be confrontational, but I need you to be able to set some boundaries. And I had like, I'd never done that before. <laughs> so <clears throat> uh, the that opportunity passes. And now a third time, he's in the clinic again. And he has another compliment. And I'm like, listen, check this out. You need to stop. And so, I mean, now in retrospect, I'm like, how come you didn't say something the first time, right? Because like the first time it happens, you think it's kind of a fluke, but it was, I had enough in my mind to think like, why does he know my name? I had no interaction with this person. And so that's also kind of what gave me the thought like, all right, so the streets are talking. We've got this brand new, I was all of maybe 20, I was 20 years old. <laughs> um, we've got this brand new discharge planner working in the clinic. She's young. Let's see what we can get with her or from her or what, what we can make happen. And he was like one of those career criminals back and forth. I mean, I'm on Rikers Island. And at that point, like everyone's going back and forth to court. Not, not everyone's sentenced. I wasn't in a sentence facility. And... <clears throat> I remember just thinking to myself, like, if I don't say something to this dude, he's going to think it's okay to keep complimenting you. And is there something in you that appreciates the compliment? Like, you cannot be just that egotistical that you're appreciating compliment from an inmate who can't do nothing for you. And so I think being able to check yourself and say something's not right here being able to reach out to someone who's got more experience than you for some guidance really matters. And then finally being able to say something to this inmate that has clearly attempted to start blurring some of the boundaries. And so compliments, maybe when you're in the street, maybe you working in a more traditional work environment, it could be appropriate. I mean, if it's not wanted, it's sexual harassment, but, um, when it's simply not wanted and you're in this correctional environment and you know these jokers always got something up them up their sleeves, like it is your best bet to nip it in the bud. Thank you, but no thank you. Not because I'm here, not because you're an inmate, but because I'm not interested. I'm not interested. And we know that in this environment, there is no such thing as consent. So I get myself caught up on some foolishness, which we see happen time and time again, right? So <clears throat> when you're new in the environment and you really don't know what to do, you got to be able to ask somebody. Don't hesitate to ask someone. If you feel something's a little wonky, it shouldn't be happening, speak up, right? Don't let the ball go down the road so far that you can't get it. You can't catch it back. You know, um, me asking the officer, Maybe I didn't even know enough to know, like, it could have been taken in some other kind of way. But I think they knew that I really didn't know and I really just wanted to know, like, what am I supposed to do? Do I come to the officer and tell the officer that the inmate is making statements? Do I say something to the inmate? Will I be accused of creating a situation? Like, will, will somebody think that I like it? Which was really my biggest concern. Like, I don't want nobody to think that I like this nonsense. And so if one inmate thinks it's okay, another inmate is going to think it's okay, and another inmate is going to think it's okay. And soon enough, you're going to be in this conundrum that you can't get yourself out of. So compliments, in my opinion, is one of those ways that you can know that you're being targeted and that the inmates kind of got a beat on you. So nip it in the bud. This is Keith Helwig with Cops Corrections Videos. If you like my videos, please hit the red subscribe button. I'd like to talk today about manipulation. Now this is manipulation used on police officers. It's manipulation used on correctional officers. I'm going to apply it mainly to the correctional officers. When we start working in prisons, the majority of people that start are like me. You're not streetwise. You know what's going on, but you're just not streetwise. And all of a sudden, you're thrown into the midst of a group of people who are streetwise, who are master manipulators. Now, you're going to meet all kinds of inmates that are master manipulators. Some of them are going to be dumber than a sack of hammers, but they're still going to try to manipulate you. Some of them are going to be quite intelligent. They're going to try to manipulate you. 
The ways they can do it is through, I call it, intellectual manipulation. They're going to try to relate to you on an intellectual level and find out your likes and dislikes. If you like sports, if you like hockey, if you like basketball, baseball, if you like hunting, fishing, if you're a history buff, whatever, they're going to try to form that as a bond between you and them. Something that you, you share together. Well, the fact of the matter is, it's a type of manipulation. Because it's only a matter of time until they find, they feel they form that connection with you. When they're going to try for some little favor. Whether it's asking you for a cigarette, whether it's asking you for an extra cup of coffee or an extra five minutes of day room time or whatever. They're going to use that intellectual manipulation to try to get what they want. You have to be careful of intellectual manipulation. As I stated, I don't care if the guy's got a IQ equal to the temperature in Wisconsin in December, he's still going to try to manipulate you. Inmates are master manipulators. They do what they have to to try to survive in prison, and part of that is manipulation of staff. They also manipulate each other. That happens, that happens quite frequently as well. But I'm more interested in the inmates that manipulate you. As I've said in previous videos, inmates are not your friend. Inmates are going to manipulate you. Any officer who says they've never been manipulated by an inmate is lying. Either that, or they were manipulated so well that they don't even realize they were manipulated. And that can happen. Can I say I was never manipulated? Hell no. During the course of my 36 career in corrections, I probably was manipulated more times than I knew about. There are good manipulators in prison. There are master manipulators. You need to watch out for them. You need to be careful that you don't get ensnared in any traps they set, whether it's traps of fraternization, whether it's traps of granting favors to inmates, whether it's a trap of making a friendly bet over a football game on the weekend. You have to watch yourself every second you're in the prison for manipulation. You have to make sure that you're the one in charge and that you're not being manipulated. It's not always easy to do. If you feel like an inmate's manipulating you, chances are, yep, they're manipulating you. Don't let it happen. Watch out for yourself. And if you see it happening with someone else, step in, say something to them. Just mention the possibility that perhaps they're being manipulated. So I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. With Christmas coming, I hope everybody has a great Christmas as well. Until next time, this is Keith Helwig for Cops Corrections Videos. Stay safe and watch your back. Hey there, Tear Tuck fans. Russ Hamilton here from Keepers of Chaos. So anyway, Anthony Ganji uh, decided that he was going to do a video. And um, it's kind of like one of those things where it's kind of like a wheel and each one of us takes a spoke. And uh, the particular subject that we're tackling today is how to know or at least how to suspect or identify when you're being manipulated. Um, so before I go into what my particular aspect that I've been assigned, or actually which I chose um, uh, to do my segment on, um, I want to set up a little bit of a of a foundation so um, you can understand uh, maybe a little better some of the terms, some of the concepts that I use when I'm talking about manipulation. So first and foremost, we're all human beings. We all you know operate according to a certain base set of principles, right? And one of those things is, is that there's a degree that we use each and every day that's manipulation. It's just, it's just what it is, but it's at a very low level and it's, you know, it's just something that occurs between us. It's, it's a little bit of give and take, but manipulation can branch out into something much more serious. Um, when someone has put you in a position where you act, to your own detriment or the detriment of your other friends or the detriment of uh, society, the detriment of your facility, the detriment of the oath that you took on your badge. Okay. So that is where manipulation transforms from manipulation into exploitation. And so um, I just want to get that down because uh, there's so many of these things that are, you know, a lot of commonality that we have because we're human beings. And so being able to identify what's going on isn't always the easiest thing in the world. So moving on from that, um, the, the particular thing that I want to address to get across to you is that in order um, 
to use this particular concept of manipulation against someone, an inmate has to do what's, what I call forging the bond, forging a social bond with you. And the way that an inmate can do that is by finding common areas of interest. All right. It's, it's not a, you know, horribly complex, you know, thing to understand, but just having something in common with you. So if I were an inmate, what would I do to try and find something in common with you that we could talk about in order to forge that social bond? Okay. So you're, you know, down there in the unit office, the yard office, out on the tier or whatever every day, and you have and take a drink out of the same mug every day. And that mug has on it the Raiders logo on it, say, for instance, right? Well, you know, there's nothing that stops that inmate from maybe doing a little bit of research, or maybe he's even actually a fan, to, you know, find out a little bit more about the team, you know, what the record is, what's been going on this year, years past, and strike up a conversation, right? Striking up a conversation, common area of interest, and what that does is that begets a chance to branch out into other things that are wider and beyond, you know, that particular area of just the football team or whatever, right? So, um, you know, we'll move on from that. Okay, that's one way that they can get to you in a common area of interest. Now, I'm not going to tell you that, that you know, bringing your team mug and there is, is, you know, some great huge security breach, but it could be. But if you're mindful of things that go on and you understand things that go on, it's much more or less so. But, you know, there's people that wouldn't even think of these things. But these inmates, because they're looking to manipulate from a standpoint of being able to exploit you, they are looking at it in that way. They are willing to do the research. They are willing to figure out how to manipulate people's hearts and people's minds. So just as, a, as another way, this could potentially happen, right? Let's say that an inmate overhears, maybe from another inmate, maybe some other of your buddies are down there here talking about it, that you just found out that your wife has epilepsy, okay? So what does that inmate do in a couple of days and stuff? He ends up striking up a conversation with you. He's done the research. He knows what to say now, you know, and he ends up telling you that his little girl who's five years old, she's had epilepsy since birth. And then he starts talking about the different drugs that she's on and the hospital that she's gone to and what some of the new, uh, you know, uh, you know, hopeful medications and treatments and stuff are for it. Right. And now he's bridged that gap and he's forged that social bond with you. OK, well, those social bonds can lead to all kinds of other things. And, you know, the spectrum of that goes from just doing some simple favor that maybe doesn't really matter for much to possibly doing a favor that, you know, helps them get out of something, you know, all the way to worst case scenario where you're completely co-opted and corrupted and you're bringing something in or you transgress that line where you begin some type of interpersonal sexual relationship with that inmate, right? So, I mean, this is just something to keep in mind and understand that, that forging those, sh those, um, social bonds allow the inmates to transgress past points where they shouldn't go. <coughs> you know, any um, young officer, or whether they're young or not, doesn't matter, but if they're brand new to the game, and, you know, they come into the prison on their very first day, they do not understand the game that's going on and the game that's being played, nor do they understand exactly what's going on with respect to how they relate to any given inmate. You know, um, the relationship that we have with inmates is extremely imbalanced with regards to power. It's about as imbalanced as you can get because we have all of it. But it's up to us to be able to keep that power and not uh, put ourselves in a position where it can be taken away. Because for an inmate to be able to bridge that large of a span to where he puts himself in a position where he can take that power from you, it takes a lot of doing. You know, it's, it's not any easy feat, but it happens all the time simply because we are not on guard on that sort of thing. So here's the last little thing I'm going to um, leave you with. Okay. Now I talked about, you know, this concept, you know, about, um, you know, common everyday, um, 
you know, things that you have in common with the inmates, right? And about how inmates are able to, you know, uh, make that social bond with you, okay? We want to keep those things from happening. This is where a lot of people talk about, you know, oh, is it really a, a, a you know, us versus them? No, it's not us versus them. It's us and them. This is why um, we did a video the other day on why labels are actually important to separate things, to give us those professional guidelines that are things that we don't go past. So the social forging of that bond, right? Social bonds enforce social contracts, right? So when you've made a bond with someone in that social thing, what does that mean? That means that what? That you're friendly or that they're your friend. What do I mean by enforcing that social contract? What do you do with your friends? All right. Well, you have your friends back, right? You look out for them. You make sure that they don't get in trouble. You do things for that friend. Now you're, now you're, you're co-opted and you're about to be corrupted because once you're at that point going that much further beyond it isn't all that hard. So just remember that when you're out there, when you're talking to these inmates, any one thing can lead to another. So just remember that though, that the social, that the social bonds enforce the social contracts. So once you've made that social bond, then you have an obligation in that contract to fulfill it as a friend to that person. That's the way humans operate. That's why we want to make sure that we maintain that professional demeanor among us at all times and to understand that when these conversations take place out there, it's really easy for them to go places that they shouldn't be going. So anyway, I hope you guys have taken something away from this. I hope that you'll be on guard against, you know, being manipulated and being exploited. So anyway, this is Russ Hamilton. I'm signing off. Oh!